The US dollar continues to weaken as rate cut hopes solidify. RBA minutes show its dual mandate stopped another rate hike. And New Zealand house prices fell ahead of the Reserve Bank's rate cut. And later on, Indonesia could cut rates today and Thailand looks set to hold. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, presents ANZ Research's revised Australian economic forecasts and says why the RBA can hold until February. We think that by the time we get to the end of this year, six-month annualised rate of inflation should be just within the Reserve Bank's band. So we do think inflation pressures will dissipate enough to enable the Reserve Bank to ease early in 2025. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, the US dollar continued to weaken overnight with the index down another 0.4% as of 4am Sydney Melbourne time. The yields on US Treasuries were also weaker. The 10-year down 4 basis points to 3.83%. That's a low for this year. As bets strengthen that the US Federal Reserve will cut in September. The markets are actually pricing for 30 basis points of cuts. The S&P 500 was down 0.25% and gold hit another record high. Meanwhile, the Reserve Bank of Australia's August meeting minutes maintained a hawkish bias when they were released yesterday. ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, says there was an interesting mention of the RBA's dual mandate. That is balancing getting inflation back to target along with preserving full employment. And that, well, it wasn't necessarily the clinching argument for keeping rates on hold, but the fact that the bank are now starting to talk a bit more about that part of the mandate, the full employment mandate, particularly given now the unemployment rates at 4.2%, I thought was interesting. And it does sort of argue that it would take something significant to get the Reserve Bank moving, that is tightening rates from here. At 4am Sydney Melbourne time, the Aussie dollar was up 0.14% at 67.37 US cents. And the Kiwi was up 0.54% at 61.46 US cents. Number two, Adam says ANZ Research still thinks the RBA will start easing rates from February. What was interesting in the minutes was a formal words that basically said we don't need to wait until inflation's back at the target before we start easing rates. Rather, we need to be confident that it's going to get back to the target. And that's important because it means we don't have to wait for inflation to be two point something before the RBA starts easing. Rather, it's about being confident we are going to get inflation back there. That really shouldn't be a huge surprise, of course, because central banks should be forward looking when they adjust policy. But it does give me some confidence that February isn't too early. Number three, New Zealand house prices fell 0.5% in July from June, according to the Real Estate Institute's index. ANZ economist Henry Russell says there's now some downside risk to ANZ researchers' forecast for prices to fall 1% this year. Although he notes the decline was before the Reserve Bank of New Zealand started cutting interest rates. So while the risk looks tilted towards further weakness in the near term, that certainly could just be a timing story and that could be made up further down the line as the housing market responds to lower interest rates. The housing market really is one of the first parts of the economy to respond to interest rates. So in that sense, it's certainly one to watch over the coming months. Number four, China's lenders held their benchmark lending rates in August. The hold was expected after a 10 basis point cut last month and after the People's Bank of China reduced its short-term rate in July. ANZ senior China strategist Zhao Pengjing says policymakers will now be watching for further weakness in the data ahead of any further rate cuts. If the data could be improved, I think the PBOC will be on hold. And if the data deteriorate again in the next few months, the PBOC will has no hesitate to cut. Number five, Thailand has a policy rate decision today. ANZ economist Crystal Tan expects rates to be held at 2.5%. But she says Bank Indonesia's review of whether to cut from 6.25% is going to be a much closer call, particularly after the Philippine Central Bank cut last week. In Indonesia's case, external constraints have been the main hurdle to monetary policy easing. But recent conditions have become more conducive for a BI pivot. Look, stopping US economic data has paved the way for lower US yields. And then we have the US Fed looking set to embark on an easing cycle from September. So, you know, we've previously highlighted scope that we'll see at least 125 basis points rate cut by BI by the fourth quarter this year. The odds are now shifting towards an earlier start and maybe even up to two cuts this year, given the current market backdrop. 
crystal tan there. Now, in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, takes us through ANZ Research's latest Australian economic forecasts and explains why the RBA doesn't need to follow too hard on the heels of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's rate cut last week. The broad sort of outline for the economy over the next 18 months or so is for growth to pick up, helped by a little bit of a pickup in household consumption, and that in turn helped by stronger growth in household incomes reflecting both lower inflation, but also tax cuts and cost of living relief measures. I guess some of the larger changes to the forecast were a little bit of an improvement in the outlook for business investment, just reflecting a reassessment on our part of the underlying IT spend, and also a very small increase to our expected peak in the unemployment rate to a quarter average of 4.4. So this really is just sort of a few nudges uh, here and there. I mean, just from a GDP point of view and the sort of inflationary pressures in the economy? Is there much of a change there? We still think inflation in underlying terms will uh, will move lower over the course of this year and into next. So we have trimmed mean inflation, which is the underlying inflation measure the Reserve Bank tends to focus on at 3.4% by the end of this year and 2.9% by the end of 2025. Importantly within that, we think that by the time we get to the end of this year, six month annualised rate of inflation should be just within the Reserve Bank's band. So we do think inflation pressures will dissipate enough to enable the Reserve Bank to ease early in 2025. Is there any sort of slight shift in the balance of probabilities from your forecast to that February number at all? I don't think so. I think February still feels reasonably balanced. November might be a little bit too soon to get a rate cut in Australia. December, though, isn't it impossible? But I think the bank will probably want to get the reassurance from a couple of better quarterly inflation numbers before easing. It's really important, of course, to remember that yearly inflation doesn't need to be within the RBA's target band for the Reserve Bank to ease. It's more about getting confidence in the trajectory and where we end up. I guess, look, the other things that could get the Reserve Bank easing more quickly, and these are less favourable things, were if we were to see, for example, a significant increase in the unemployment rate and a further slowdown in growth those things would also get the RBA easing. But I think the most likely outcome is we get that moderation in inflation and that gives the RBA just enough comfort by the time we get into early next year to ease, even though year-ended inflation will still be, in underlying terms anyway, above the top of the RBA's target band. Does the context around Australia with other central banks starting to ease change things much at all? The fact that the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, most slightly the Federal Reserve next month are all easing doesn't necessarily mean the Reserve Bank can't go in in a different direction, but it it does make the hurdle or the degree of confidence you'd need if you were the Reserve Bank to tighten a a fair bit larger. And what I mean by that is, I guess, if globally central banks are moving in one direction, you need to be really, really confident that you're not about to make a mistake if you move in the other direction. So what we're seeing globally certainly increases the hurdle for the Reserve Bank to act on their tightening bias. I think it also does remind us that this has been a relatively synchronised global shock and cycle. So global inflation was relatively synchronised. The response by central banks on the way up to increase interest rates was relatively synchronised. Inflation has moderated everywhere at broadly similar rates. And then really, I think what we're seeing here in Australia is differences at the margin. We were a little slower to start our tightening cycle. We didn't go quite as aggressively so will be a little slower when it comes to easing, but really, ultimately, only uh, two quarters really behind the rest of the world, which when you step back in 10 years' time and look at the sweep of history that encompasses this time period, that somebody was moving five or six or four months after somebody else probably won't end up seeming all that significant, even though when you're in it in the here and now, it feels like a very long period of time to wait. Adam Boyton there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Wednesday, August the 21st. Catch you tomorrow with more from Adam on whether the Australian situation fits the definition of heading for a soft landing. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.